Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. ¡Wow! Gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell. Okay, we're going to talk some Congress. We always go to this guy, Eric Garcia. He is the congressional reporter for The Independents. Also got a great book out. We'll talk about that in a little bit. How are you, sir? Great to talk to you again. Doing all right. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm a little worried about you and your job security because we did the State of the Union but something that's not really getting reported much on, except I hear it from all the people that cover Congress, this Congress is doing nothing. And I thought that was a little bit of hyperbole. And then I went and looked at the Senate schedule. They're averaging one vote a day since they convene. One. Yeah. And it's usually a proceed. There's literally nothing going on in Congress right now. This is amazing. There is. The Senate is literally. I was talking with a friend of mine. It's like basically at the end of the year last year, they passed the omnibus. And then after theirs, they're like, okay, we did what we did what we needed to do. Um, because like if you remember after Warnock won the uh, runoff, Schumer said, we're just gonna focus on judges. Judges, 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 like he was taking a page out of Mitch McConnell's book. Um, but they're just have mostly, as you said, been procedural votes. There was like a vote to confirm an assistant secretary or something, but there, and, and I think there was one for a judge. But it's not like you know the the much to the chagrin of Democrats, there the 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 judicial confirmation assembly line hasn't been initiated, and conversely, there hasn't been a lot of movement on really anything else. And then meanwhile, <clears throat> on the House side. And we can talk about the house later. Kevin has basically had to do a bunch of uh, performative votes. I think it's fair to call them <laughs> to uh, to appease the uh, the gremlins in his in his in his conference. So 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 yeah, they just haven't gotten anything done. What? <laughs> Look, I'm all for gridlock because you can't screw anything up if you're not doing anything at all. But this is really remarkable stuff. Now, we knew some of this was going to happen because it's such a thin majority. You know, yes. even though this, the Democrats have the Senate, they have a slim majority also. So they, we knew some of this was baked into the cake. But this is really amazing for the start of a presidential election cycle. And let's all be honest, all the House members start running right around December. So they, they've got yes. about, you know, eight, nine months until they start running again. There, there's no sense of urgency. I know how much, give me the ratio though. How much of this is the gridlock of the situation? How much of it is leadership not knowing how to handle it and move the minutia of the Senate and the House? So I would say it's about a hybrid. I would say it's about 60, 40. Part of it is, as you said, part of it is, as you said, it's that they have, because even because on the, on the Senate side, there's a 51, 49 split. So there's that, uh, not counting the fact that Kirsten Sinema uh, basically became an independent. She still caucuses with the Democrats, but she's you know, she's friendly with a lot of Republicans and votes for them sometimes. On the House side, the Republicans have a ten seat majority that's going to become a nine seat majority after a special election in Virginia. 
so part of it is just handling these very very slim majorities the other part of it is that they just did it is that on the senate side they hadn't sorted out their committees until like not this last week but the week before they hadn't even they had it uh because what happened is um Eric Schmidt, the said the new senator from Missouri, wanted to be on judiciary with Greitens, and then they didn't get they didn't give it to him. So he wound up going he wound up going on Veterans Affair, uh, Armed Services, and then Holly was was taken off went off Armed Services. So they they've just been playing musical chairs because Republicans have one less seat. And then on the <clears throat> House side, they had trouble with sorting through committees because. McCarthy, let's be honest, he wanted revenge after they kicked off Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar. So there had been there was a lot of back and forth on committee sortings on that one. And on top of that, they had to um, organize these new committees on China, uh, COVID and the uh, weaponization committee. Yeah, let's talk about that committee real quick. Um, Eric Garcia joining us. There's been a lot of hubbub about it. Jim Jordan's heading it. Yes. What are they actually doing? Because everybody's got their opinions of it. You know, the Republicans are saying this is the hold accountable stuff. The Democrats are saying this is going to be a perpetual Benghazi hearing. What's the truth of it? What are they actually doing in the committees? And more to the point, how's Jim Jordan? do? Look, Jim Jordan's wanted this power for a long time. He's angled for it. Now he's got yes. it. What's he actually doing with it? So this is the thing that I've said about Jim Jordan. The reason why he didn't want to be Speaker of the House is that <clears throat> being 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 the guy in the chair is very different from being a, a a bomb thrower, which is what he's been through the majority of his career. Um, John Boehner used to call him a legislative terrorist, um, but now I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to split the balance between seeming like a responsible chairman of a committee while still being the guy who hoots and hollers about James Comey and Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. So I went, so I was actually in the room for the first uh, two hours, I think of that um, weaponization committee before my, before my mom called and you got to answer to mom, no matter where she calls you. Um, and <clears throat> so, uh, so 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 what he what basically they did is that they had this opening panel with Chuck Grassley, Ron Johnson, Jamie Raskin, and Tulsi Gabbard of all people. And basically Johnson and uh Grassley complained that the federal government was interfering with their FBI, with their with their investigation into the Biden family. And Tulsi Gabbard just went on to a whole tirade about how she was, uh, how she was, how people were mean to her about like, and said that she was a Russian agent. Um, it, and it was, it really just kind of, and, but, and a lot of it was, you know, moaning and a lot of other things about the Twitter files and Elon Musk. So really the, the question, and I said this, you know, my takeaway from that was, the difficulty, I think, for a lot of Republicans on that committee is making the things that they that they care about seem like it's stuff that other people should care about. Uh, and, and that's really been the difficult thing. It, it, it has. But so far, it hasn't necessarily and, and given it's just the first week. So it hasn't produced the fruit and it hasn't led to, you know, the kind of. Um, wall-to-wall -wall marquee headlines that I think Jim Jordan and Kevin McCarthy wanted it to have. Yeah, I'm part of that, Eric Garcia. This is not the January 6th committee. This is no. a fully staffed committee with both sides. The names on the Democratic side, for people that don't know, the other than Debbie Washerman Saltz, who headed up the DNC, so she has a little bit probably more of a national profile. Guys like Jerry Conley, Sylvia Grace, Linda right. Sanchez, these aren't big-time names. These are people that know how to do committees, though. There's pushback on this thing. There is a back. By the way, Jordan's actually doing a pretty good job with fair time as far as the committee members go. Obviously, yes. the witnesses are going to slant, but he's he's playing it straight with the committee members. He's he's yes. doing his job in that regard. But that also means they're getting pretty close to equal time on this thing. I'm just looking at it from the outside, so I'm like, yeah, I know Macy and Gates and Stefanik's on these committees. Is there any way an outside observer is not just going to look at this and see it as a wash? Yeah, that, that's the other thing is so so Jerry Connolly and Dan Goldman had I think some of the best questioning on the Democratic side 
Um, I, th- I think that Stacey Plaskett, who's the rep, who's the um, who's who's the ranking Democrat, had pretty much had, had had some good questioning and had a, and had a pretty strong opening statement. So the fact that it, it, so as you said, again, because this is a very um, narrow, because Republicans have a very narrow majority, it's not like they have a bunch of committee members who can just um, overwhelm the Democrats. That leads, like you said, to it kind of just people seeing this as basically a break even. And, uh, and um, you know, Goldman had a pretty interesting exchange with Jordan. I'm sure, you know, it, it made the rounds on the Internet. Uh, and, and for those who don't know, Dan Goldman was the head attorney during um, the first impeachment for Trump uh, with the with the Ukraine stuff. So 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 as, as you said, it was very it, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I kind of walked away from it saying, feeling like this didn't move the needle either one way or the other. Yeah, I agree with that. And the other problem you got is, and I've, I've asked people this question. I still haven't got a good answer. Is like Jim Jordan's the guy who's like, I'm not going to answer any subpoenas. Why is anybody getting subpoenaed this thing? The, their first opening statement going to be, well, you didn't answer your subpoena. Why do I got to answer my subpoena? And I think that's going to kind of be the doom loop that this thing's going to get into other than just the sound bites and the partisanship that's going to come out of it, of what they're going to. I don't think anybody outside of that's really going to get any traction on this. Is that a, is that a fair way to look at it? It is a fair way to look at it. I think, you know, again, because of the fact that he didn't answer subpoenas on the, on the January 6th committee, he didn't, uh, you know, and he, he's basically kind of flat, thumbed his nose at it. Uh, that, that has kind of led to him. Uh, that, that's kind of, that, that, that could actually kind of uh, backfire on him. Incidentally enough, the, the funny thing about that, <clears throat> oversight committee about that organization committee is yes you got your gates and your stephonics and all that it was not as much of a circus as the oversight committee hearing the day before which was um a debacle and i think that kevin is probably regretting putting and i should say james comer is a pretty you know evenly you know fair-handed guy but and Jamie Raskin, from what I understand, likes him. And when I've talked to them, they, they get along. But I think that Kevin is regretting putting Marjorie Taylor Greene on that committee. Um, yeah. So, 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 so it, it, that that hearing was much more of a debacle. So. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. Te adoro, Sam. ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Marjorie Taylor Greene, too, because I've got a little bit of a working theory on here. I think, and people, look, this is just, we do a dog grown folk talk here. Probably the best thing that ever happened to Marjorie Taylor Greene was the Democrats stripping of her committees because yes. never, nobody listened to her talk outside of conservative media for two years. Yes. Anybody that pays a lick of attention to her, they can't hide her now. And I know no, they, I, she's not the only crazy person in Congress. <laughs> There's a couple on the Democratic side that say really Looney Tunes things, but she's just kind of... Look, Kevin made the deal. Kevin McCarthy, yes. she buddied up to Kevin to get her committee assignments back. She's got it. They can't hide her now. And she she ought to be an in-kind donation to Democrats because she is just so off the wall with this stuff. I think this in the long run is actually going to end up being her undoing the fact that she's actually on the committees now. No question, because 
she, I remember like after she got stripped of committee, she says, oh, well, now I have more time to like do other things back in like 2021. And weirdly enough, she was kind of right about that because if you're on committees, that means you actually kind of have to do serious, important work. Say what you will about Matt Gates, but if you remember the thing that he wanted when he twisted the knife into McCarthy was he wanted a chairmanship over, over uh, I think it was for uh, a subcommittee on armed services, which makes sense. He represents Pensacola. He represents the Panhandle. There's military bases there. Green for all for, for for you know doesn't have those same interests it's not like she's it's not like she necessarily wants to you know get something through uh, across the across the finish line on education or government reform or anything like that she's just going to be um i think fair to say peacocking um on these committees and then these things are going to go viral these things are going to go uh these these, these things are going to make the round on the internet and instantly enough ironically enough uh the person she she's now on the committee you know that she's on oversight she's now going toe to tour toe to toe with um aoc which criticisms of her aside and there are plenty of criticisms i've made criticisms of her she's a good questioner in these hearings and she doesn't peacock so it's it's a um it's it, it you know it, it probably might be there and doing and as I said Kevin might come to regret putting her on oversight because she's going to be asking about the Twitter files and Elon Musk and you know COVID origins and she's also on the COVID origins committee as well so that's going to uh, be another thing. Yeah, Eric Garcia joins. Okay, we've been beating up on the Republicans. Let's talk Democrats for a second. Sure. Chuck Schumer hadn't had a whole lot to do because they're waiting on the House to do anything. He yeah. does have two themes developing here. He's yeah. talking. A lot about the debt limit, which all he's got to do is sit still because they're going to pass a debt limit. It, Kevin painted himself on a quarter in there. So he's just waiting on that shoe to drop so he can hammer them. He is definitely just going to talk about China nonstop. This is all yes. he's talking about now is China, China, China. He's got some simpatico with Mitch and the Republicans on this so he can call it as a bipartisan issue. This is something that obviously the White House is going to be paying attention to. This is not – look. Chuck thing Chuck Schumer plans these things out. This is a theme. He's not going to get a whole lot of stuff from the House GOP, so he's just going to hammer this China stuff. Is that a fair way to assess where that's at? That is absolutely a fair assessment. And of course, with these unidentified uh, unidentified objects, uh, what was interesting? I'm sure you saw this uh, on Saturday. Uh, Senator John Tester said that they found another uh, another. Um, object flying over the sky in montana and tester put out a put out a thing and, and what, what i it was interesting when i i saw it and i interpreted it as oh chuck's giving tester who hasn't made a decision about running yet um a little bit of breathing room it is allowing him to um kind of sit, look like he's doing serious work and, and, and that's not to say that tester is insincere uh, uh but but it, it's allowing him to be seen as this as you know, keeping a monitor over this thing after the, after the, another flying device came over the skies of, of Montana. That was that, that really stood out to me. And I was like, oh, Chuck is give Chuck Schumer is giving uh, John Tester some breathing room. Yeah, Eric Garcia joining us. While we're on the subject, look, I'm one of those cynical people. Uh, yes. I'm very cynical about stuff. No, I don't believe in aliens. No, I don't believe in UFOs. Yes, I study history. I'm all for sh shooting down anything that encroaches on our airspace because that's a sovereignty issue. I also study history. This is not the first, last, or will be the last time our airspace has been violated by a foreign power. Let's be adults here for a second. You just mentioned it. There's a political aspect to all these unidentified things getting shot down. And yeah. this, all this, my question, when something comes out like this is not, why is it happening? My second question is, why are we hearing about it? Well, yeah. I've got a little bit of a theory that we're hearing about this because this GOP Congress came in saying they're going to cut the DOD budget. There is now wide ranging reporting that Biden's budget proposals is going to have an increase in DOD yes. spending. Gee, Will Wally Willikers, wouldn't you know that anything vaguely looking like a threat that the DOD can answer is getting a whole lot of press? Look, there's politics involved in these stories. 
Yeah, I mean, now, now take into account with the um, with the the first balloon that we knew of, uh, not this last week, but the previous week, that wasn't spotted by the DOD. That was spotted by people in Montana. Uh, so, so, so taking it, but the fact that they shot down the device uh, over the coast of the Carolinas, and the fact that it, ha- uh, and, you know, that that was interesting. That the fact that uh, Admiral Kirby, that uh, John Kirby, who's the NSC spokesman, uh, spent basically the entirety of his brief of the press press briefing last week on Friday talking about it. Despite the fact the president's going to Poland to show solidarity with Ukraine, it does show that I think that the DOD and the Pentagon is absolutely trying to make the case that we can't make the cuts because there are, and I should, I should also add, the, the House, members of the House GOP are talking about this, but the Senate GOP is very much, um, no, this is unacceptable. As soon as the balloon was shot down, Mitch McConnell said that the president need, can't cut his defense budget. He needs to increase the defense budget. Uh, plenty of senators like uh, like Senator Roger Wicker, who's on armed services, I think he's the ranking member on armed services, said that this is a that cutting defense spending is a no go. So this is going to be uh, so the, pre- the the White House uh, Senate Republicans and some House Democrats are basically telling the 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 really reverend conservatives no this ain't happening you're not cutting the defense budget yeah and there's a lot of, here defense is like education is like well you can't do it. most of the budget has nothing to do with the frontline troops that's what they're talking right. about cutting. so this is just kind of the old <laughs> administrative yeah, yeah. It, there's plenty to cut in the dod that wouldn't hurt the troops whatsoever okay eric garcia the the debt ceiling is going to be the theme because there's nothing else going on there's yeah. going to be a deal here of some kind What's yes. the pound of flesh involved here that gets this over the starting line, and does Kevin McCarthy survive it? Okay, those are two very important questions. So first off, yes, they are going to raise the debt limit. Don Bacon, who is a moderate from Nebraska, said that they're not going to do what's called a discharge petition, which would allow for all the Democrats and some moderate Republicans to just bring a clean debt ceiling increase um to the floor without without going through the committees but i think that ultimately was and mccarthy has said ultimately that social security and medicare are off the table that hasn't but what he didn't say is he didn't say medicaid and uh you know my good friend joseph surprise roy uh asked joe manchin about uh, about medicaid and he said and he kind of showed some openness but then when i talked to joe manchin he said that we're not scaring the bejesus out of people about things that they depend on so that might be something they there might be some cuts around the margins around the uh, you, you know but i don't think but the, incidentally enough the person who um <clears throat> Who, who, who laid it out the most was AOC, which she said, look, if you don't touch Social Security and Medicare and you don't touch defense, you don't have that big a chunk of when it comes to not when it comes to discretionary spending and non-discretionary spending. You're going to have trouble making the kind of cuts, especially because Republicans want to uh, put the, uh, you know, balance the budget within 10 years. When you take Social Security and Medicare off the table and you take defense off the table, that is un, that is infeasible. So the question then becomes, uh, and, and of course, take into account that there's still the Democrats still control the Senate. So they're probably not going to say they're probably not going to say that yes to a lot of the kind of cuts that House Republicans want anyway. So that is uh, so really the question is, what is there left to cut? And then the question comes, um, will Kevin be able to get enough Republicans Will he be able to follow the Hastert rule? And for those who don't know, the, the Hastert rule, named after an actual pedophile who went to prison, uh, it means that the Republi- that that Repu- House Republicans need to get a majority of their party to put anything on the floor. I don't know if that can actually get the uh, if that can actually get to the floor. So so so, so or, or that or without without Kevin having to ask the Democrats for hat in hand. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. 
From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutans. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find the Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thesweatypenguin.com. Yeah, and both of those will be brutal to him in his own raucous caucus that he's trying to hold on to. Okay, uh, one last question. We are entering the presidential light. Look, Biden's going to run again. We've got most yeah. of the Republicans. Um, Nikki Haley's going to be announcing here probably next week. It looks like Trump's already in. DeSantis's people are saying his timeline's somewhere around May to June. So yes. we're in a holding pattern on this. Presidential elections affect what Congress does a lot, a yes. lot. What is the congressional? Because that's what you cover. What are they waiting to drop in the presidential cycles? Are they trying to just get this debt limit done before that kicks in the full gear and then they can just do committee stuff? How's Congress and the Senate reacting to the calendar ticking on the presidential season? Well, I mean, I think that it was interesting. I talked with Brendan Buck, who worked for John Boehner and Paul Ryan uh, right after the midterm election. And he said, absolutely, Trump being in the presidential cycle and being in the presidential uh, full is going to absolutely affect this because if Trump posts something on Truth Social um, and he says, Kevin, don't take the deal, need to be strong, all caps, uh, or we don't have a country, um, uh, then that could affect a debt limit deal. Conversely, um, Ron DeSantis never really had a relationship with Kevin. So I think that uh, because he was part of the Freedom Caucus and all those folks when he was a member of Congress. So it absolutely does affect it. I think that what I'm sure that McCarthy is definitely thinking about the fact that if Trump doesn't like a deal that they've done on, you know, the, the, the budget or a continued resolution or, uh, or or the debt limit, that uh, he's going to have Marjorie Taylor Green knocking on his door sometime soon. Uh, and it's not going to be pretty. Yeah, Eric Garcia, I'll ask you this because I did a Fox hit a couple of weeks ago and they were asking about it. Look, he can go back on Twitter whenever he wants to because I'm talking about Trump here. And and Elon begged, borrowed, and tried to shame him into coming back already, and he hadn't yet. This this true social thing, he's supposed to wait six hours or whatever. It's got a regulatory problem. It may be going under before even then. The yeah. rumor is that his agreement ends with them anyway somewhere around May or June. That's about the time presidential season really kicks off. Trump can get back on Facebook now, Meta. That includes Instagram, all this stuff. If you start getting, I'm just looking at the congressional calendar here. This is about the time all this stuff's going to really get icky yes. and dicey. This March through June. Look, that's going to be the make or break of this Congress is the March through June period of this year. That may be the time that the presidential season really kicks off. That might be the time Trump returns to social media properly. That's a lot of cross streams all at once for folks to deal with. It is, it is, it is going to enter cross streams. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, uh, Paul Ryan used to joke that he said, like, every morning I wake up and I check all of Trump's tweets that I'm going to pretend that I haven't seen this morning. Uh, and, and that is absolutely going to be Speaker McCarthy in the coming weeks because he's going to have to he's going to have to pretend to say that, you know, Trump's the president, but he doesn't lead the Congress. He's not the Speaker of the House. Uh, but but he's also but also he's kind of in a bind because as people might have remembered if you because thanks to the C-SPAN cameras Marjorie Taylor Greene got Trump on the phone to try to whip up votes for him so Kevin it's kind of I'm trying to think of the word Kevin owes Trump a debt and Trump could basically at any moment tweet out 
I got Kevin the speaker the the votes for the speakership. Don't pass a debt limit increase. And then what is he going to do? You know, does he survive the summer? I it, it, it could very easily the, the, so so the question of whether he survives the summer or not it has has always been the that that's the question everybody else has but the the the. Because he has question. to pass the debt limit. Like, let, yeah, let, let's yeah. play this out. He is going to pass the debt limit. That yes, is going will. to happen, but, which breaks yeah, all his promises. Which breaks all of his promises because he got rid of the get part rule. He got rid of a lot of the other rules. The question then is who leads the revolt? Because it's got to be someone with credibility. It can't be Matt Gates. It can't be Lauren Boebert. It's got to be one of the you know 10 or 13 Republicans who switched their votes on him. And the other question is, who do they put up in exchange I- I- instead of him? Uh, that that's that to me is the real question is if he the, the way he survives is who leads this revolt against him, and do they have a credible alternative? Because Scalise is not going to knife him yet. Uh, Jim Banks is leaving for the Senate. Um, well, Stefa- yeah, well, Stefanik, but well, as we've talked to before, I I've, I've said it since she did it. Stefanik did not burn all her bridges to sit at the number three spot. So Scalise better do it or get off the pot because he might get double knife because he's got her standing behind him. I'm just, yep. I'm just throwing a name out there. Like she, she didn't look, she's an Ivy league. She was into the, she didn't burn all those bridges to be the number three in the house. Yeah. She's ambitious. That's somebody I would watch. Scalise may do it himself. Banks yeah. is off to the Senate supposedly, and that's going to get ugly. But I, I would think it would be one of those two, right? It would be one of those two. I don't. Emmer, Emmer, I think is waiting to, to actually move up in the ranks after he after he had a, an admittedly good two terms as NRCC chairman. But the but the the the, the real question, as you said, is Stefanik or, uh, or or Scalise. The question the, the question is again, Kevin might survive if his the, the the thing Kevin McCarthy has going for him is that his enemies are probably just as incapable of getting the votes as he is. Is, is the best way I could put it. What a time to be alive and to cover Congress, my friend. You, you, my friend, have good job security because this is going to be one of the crazier two-year periods in the history of the United it's, States it's Congress. Uh, Eric Garcia, we always appreciate it. Let folks know where they can find and follow you. Promote the book. We didn't touch on it today, but you did an article a little while back on uh, autism and the electroshock treatment that was just shocking. Make sure you mention that real quick for folks where they can find your book. Now out in paperback and yes. how they can follow you until we get you back on her tell again. Yeah, uh, right here. We're not broken. Change the autism conversation available where every, wherever you can get your books. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at your local bookshop, online, IndieBound, whatever. You can also follow me on Twitter at Eric M. Garcia. I wrote an article for the Boston Globe about the fact that Congress finally passed legislation to allow for the end of electroshock therapy on autistic students. If that makes you go WTF, me too. Um, so, uh, so thank you very much. I always love being on the show. Yeah, you do great work. We'll talk to you soon. Keep your head down up there, brother. You keep them straight. All right. You see you soon. See you, Eric. Right, welcome back to her tell. Okay, new face. Love having these. Another great young voices contributor. Although she's kind of like me, we're kind of pushing the term a little bit, but we're happy to be there. Elizabeth Grace Matthews, well educated, went to every school in Pennsylvania except for Pitt. So we're going to call her a friend. How are you, ma'am? Glad to see you. Great. Thank you so much for having me on. Thrilled to have you. Uh, she went to University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, St. Joe's. Uh, she's one of those right-hand Pennsylvania folks, the Philadelphia area. Let's start right there, though. We're going to talk a little education today. Let's start a little big picture here, though. This is one of those things that came out of COVID because we can't talk education without COVID because COVID changed how everybody viewed education. Actually, let's rephrase that. That's the first time a lot of people paid attention to education. Let's just be real right here, right? We know one of the biggest problems out of COVID was the poorest among us, the least advantaged, disparate people groups. Those folks got absolutely hammered with school closures. You have a piece out in the uh, Post-Gazette in Pittsburgh. This goes into the school choice argument directly because those kids didn't have a choice when it came to public education. 
there's the school choice movement that's going on. There's a gap here. We've got to close this gap up between the poorest among us, the least advantaged among us, and getting them better options for school. That's really the long and the short of the problem here, isn't it? Yes, it really is. And and part of what I'm sort of talking about here is that the rest of us already have these options, and we always have. We are able to make choices about where we live. We're able to make choices um, about where we send our children to school if we live in a place where We'd rather pay for uh, private or parochial school than send our children to the public school. Some people homeschool, um, but and, and more people are homeschooling than ever um, after COVID because a lot of people were forced into homeschool during COVID. But those choices are really hard if you don't have the financial capacity to pay for school or to live where you want or have two incomes so that one of you can maybe work less. Um, if you're a single parent or if you just don't have the, the financial capacity or resources to move, it can be really, really tough. And you're sort of trapped in in schools that maybe aren't performing the way that you wish they were. Um, and that's why there's so many children that are on wait lists for scholarships um, in, in Philadelphia, where I'm from, as well as across the country. Yeah. So let's talk about this because poverty is never going to go away. We're going to keep working on it, but, you know, th that's always going to be a problem. There's always going to be the haves and the have nots. You just you just laid it out. The people that have means they they already vote with their feet. They already have. You know, look, there's a reason on the the real estate websites. The number one thing looked at is school districts. Right. It's a selling point for home. It's just the way it's always going to be. So how do we do this? There's no way to get into how do you do this without dispersing money. And when you're talking about public education, you're talking about tax dollars, you're talking about our money. That's where this gets sticky in a hurry, because when it gets to the money, everybody's going to argue where the money goes. But there's no way around the money in this problem, is there? There really isn't, unfortunately. And, you know, I certainly have no problem with public school. I think a lot of people don't have problems with public school. But I send my children to parochial school because I prefer them to be in a school where I know they're getting the kind of education I want them to get and where it's an environment where I feel that I can um, have access to leaders that I want to have access to. You know, some school districts, even if they're good ones or even if they're OK ones, they are so big that some parents feel they're not heard or they're not able, um, especially during COVID, to have their concerns brought to bear about schools being open or not. And so I think that um, for the students that are in the districts where it is been generations now of disinvestment and also misinvestment, right? So we're spending a good amount of money per student in some of the districts where the outcomes are the worst. And we're doing that despite the fact that more money doesn't always solve the problems because it's not just how much money, it's um, the ways that we're using it or not to benefit students' outcomes. And so whether the, it's because they're smaller or because there are other um, incentives for students to attend them based on scholarships or because the parents that are getting their students into private or parochial schools are also bringing other resources to bear. You know, it's really hard for the people that are are the most stuck. And those are the people that need help the most. And so those are the ones for whom school choice with either educational um, savings plans or with um, tax credits to to get scholarships to attend those schools can be the most helpful. Elizabeth Grace Matthews joining us. There's a class problem here, too, not just a poor problem, because school choice you know, let's be honest here. It becomes a middle class and up debate because those are the people that can kind of afford to pay for product. So then it gets back into this thing with the poor. You covered in your piece about this. There is some cross pol there is some cross politics to this. This is cutting across party lines. It's cutting across ideological lines in some areas because wanting the best for your children is a universal concept. How do we get it out of that rut of probably middle class, upper middle class up uh, being that kind of an issue and bridging that gap, not just with the money, but with the perception of it, of this is something that needs to be for everybody, not just the very rich, not just for the middle class of means that are trying to climb the ladder or whatever you want to. If you have a kid going to school, they should have a better option of school. 
Thank you so much. That's a great question. And I think we are doing that. I mean, I think the National School Choice Week that just occurred highlighted that a lot of states are putting more options for school choice on the books. And I think that COVID really highlighted nationwide the depth and breadth of this problem because it wasn't just about um, the school outcomes, which obviously the test scores fell dramatically during COVID across a lot of public school districts in the country, particularly in those where parents were working, children weren't in school. So I'm not sure what else could have possibly happened, right? You're going to have those those gaps and it, it makes achievement gaps bigger between people with socioeconomic resources and those without them. So I think that most people are starting to see that this is really the way to go. And I think that particularly parents in those school districts, they, they want that choice. The numbers are pretty significant about which, um, you know, about how high the numbers are in terms of people that want school choice in both political parties and across the country. Yeah, Elizabeth Grace Matthews joining us. Uh, you've been in education a lot. You're very well educated. You have a terminal degree. You understand the machinery part of this, right? It's a conveyor belt. That's part of the breakdown here too, right? It's not just the school choice and the public school versus private school or homeschooling or micro schools or whatever. This is a disruption to the system as it exists. Now, there's a lot of people who are like, we'll burn the whole system down. Well, we can't do that because even on the best estimates, you're still going to have 90% of kids in public school, right? How do we have this debate where there's a coexistence? Because I think that's really the path forward here, that everybody has some options, but part of those options is still going to be needing a healthier public school system. How do we get that coexistence? Because that's really probably going to be the path where you actually get some movement here, right? Absolutely. I think, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom is really the, the way to go for sure. Um, a lot of people love their public schools, whether it's because they moved to a place exactly as you said, where they wanted to be in those schools, or whether because they are in a school that has done a lot to make themselves competitive and make themselves a great place for kids to be, even if they're not in the best district. So this really is on a micro level about individual schools. But exactly as you stated on the system level, it's about making sure that people can choose where to be, whether it's choosing different public schools, not being restricted by their zip code, but perhaps by a broader county, or whether it's using charter schools, which are public schools, but run um, not by public school districts, or choosing private schools, or having the option to receive some funds to facilitate some sort of school and co-op and homeschool. These are all things that we experimented with quite a bit during the pandemic because we had to. Yeah. There's another aspect to this, too. Look, I went to both public and private schools. My children have gone to both. My youngest are in public schools because we're in a good school district. I had those options. I want everybody else to have those options. Some of these options don't hit people right. When you start talking about the lottery system for some of these, especially really um, rural, inner city, things like this, really desperate circumstances, and you've got a lottery that really hits people wrong. It hits me wrong. And I'm all for school choice. It just feels wrong. It feels icky. It's like, this isn't right. There's just slapping school choice on the problem isn't going to solve it. There's a lot of nuts and bolts to this. How do we get into the policy parts of this? Because you can have all the ideology in the world if it's not implemented correctly. Look, there's a lot of bad private schools out there too, right? How do we have the conversation of like, look, it's not enough to just use the terminology. We have to put the work in whether it's a public school or a private school, there's a big accountability factor because that's something else we learned in COVID too, is when people don't hold accountability, that's when you really start having problems with these education systems. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that the lottery systems, you know, obviously it's great. Each kid that can get into a school that will give them better opportunities, that's great for that kid, but it still leaves a lot of kids behind. And, you know, this is the situation that we're forced into in many places where there isn't universal school choice, there aren't vouchers or educational savings plans 
or ways for every parent to have that option. You know, right now in Philadelphia, we're spending way more than the average parochial school, at least, and some private schools spend per student. And yet the outcomes for public schools are not great. And so I think that giving parents access to actual funds, right, whether they want to um, live in a school district where they use those funds to, to go to their public school, which is fine, or whether they want to use those funds to, to pay for some other option. And I think in particular, um, some states, I believe Arizona is one, and there, there are definitely some others, also offer funds for the use of co-ops or of online options or things of that nature, which I think broadens the scope and possibilities for each family. So I do agree with you. I think there has to be universal access to funds. It can't just be, okay, one out of every you know 20 kids is going to get this opportunity and we'll call it a day. Yeah, Elizabeth Grace Matthews joining us. We were joking about it before we started. The numbers, people just roll their eyes at it, whether it's economics or politics or education or whatever, that we're just numbed to the numbers. So we can throw out all the stats in the world. I think the more, the better path forward here, though, is telling some of the stories of these students. Because like we just said, you know, the funding numbers, everybody, you know, it's it's a massive amount of money and we're not getting a return on the investment. You just touched on it. The system is the system. The bureaucracy is the bureaucracy. How do we tell the story of these kids, both the success stories and the horror stories, to kind of get people re-engaged in the education system? Because I think what COVID showed was people are disengaged. They were disinterested in the entirety of the system. Once it affected their kids, now they got engaged. Shouldn't we be doing more storytelling of the actual students here, the ones that need a better school or the ones that are having successful school? I think that might be a better way policy forward telling those stories than just throwing out raw numbers. Yes, I think that's that's definitely true. Um, I think that, you know, obviously this is a place where local journalism is super helpful in terms of people actually getting on the ground and, and telling stories of individuals. Um, I remember back when I was in, I either college or high school, the documentary Waiting for Superman came out. And that was extremely powerful for a lot of people that care about this issue. Um, my husband happened to grow up in the worst school district in the state of Ohio, and his parents were able to cobble together parochial school um, funds for four kids. But that's, you know, they were able to do that. And it was really a struggle for them to do that. And a lot of people that grew up where he grew up, their parents didn't have that ability. And you know, my husband and I met at the University of Pennsylvania and he's a lawyer and those things are obviously because, you know, he was able to, to do them, but it's also because he had the opportunity to do them, which a lot of people don't have. And um, as he's been involved in this work over, over the years, I know telling that story and telling the stories of others he knows in similar circumstances has been really powerful. Yeah, I, one of my good friends, you know, grew up very poor, became a lawyer. But it wasn't because they were rich. It's because they, you know, took student loans off their tail, worked their tail off, got some scholarships and put themselves through school. Those kind of stories, though, I find education. And I wrote about this recently. I think education is one of those like a lot of complex problems. We need a whole lot more all of the above than just the pet project fixes that we do more and more and more. How do we get to that place? How do we communicate this? Because there is a little bit of danger. We already touched on it. School choice is getting buzzwordy. And we're kind of losing it and it's become a political viable thing. It raises a lot of money. Let's be honest here. How do we keep the focus on the goal of it going forward? Not just school choice, but education, student-centered education. How do we change our language and the communication of this thing going forward so that we keep moving the ball forward for the children, right? The thing that blows all this up anyway, but actually mean it when we say it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a, Great point. And I think a lot of it is the fact that you're absolutely right. When we say education, people go deaf to it because some people care about it. Some people don't. People care about it only when it affects their kids. When people don't care, they just move on from it. It's not a thing that affects everyone, right? Um, because some people feel, well, I already raised my kids or I don't have kids or whatever the case might be. But it really does affect everyone because it's also an economic issue and um, a socioeconomic issue. Um, you know, equality issue. And when I say equality, I don't mean everyone having the same amount of money. I mean, everyone having the opportunity to make their lives what they want to make them. And um, 
you know, we have a knowledge economy now. We're, we're about to have a post whatever the economy is that we had after the industrial economy, that's going away. We're gonna have whatever the next thing we're gonna call it is. And, you know, in this technological knowledge economy that we have, we need people that are able to read, write, reason in, in ways that um, perhaps 50 years ago wasn't as necessary as it is now because of all the jobs that use skills that we no longer teach that, um, that have gone away. And so jobs that are, are going to be coming online are jobs that are going to require people to be able to have those skills of literacy and numeracy and, and reason. And these are things that we should all be worried about as, as a country. Um, in addition, I do think there's room. A lot of people talk about more vocational education, about um, making students able not just to have the choice of a school district or of a better school or something like that, but also have the choice of, you know, I know I want to be an electrician or I know I want to be, you know, whatever the case might be and, and be able to track myself into doing that so that we wind up being able to fill some of the, the job vacancies that will come online in the next, you know, many years. Yeah, Elizabeth Grace Matthews, always an important topic. We talk education a lot on this program. We're going to keep talking about it because it's never going to go away because we got to keep educating our kids. How we do that says a lot about our government and our society and all of us. So we're going to keep talking about it. It's a great piece. It's in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. We're going to link to the entire piece. Make sure you read it yourself. Till we get you back on the program to talk again, let folks know where they can find you, how they can follow you, and how they can keep up with you till we see you again on Hurt Till. Thank you so much. Um, I am on Twitter at Elizabeth G. Matt, and I'm also on Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, if you Google, you'll find me. Yep, we're going to do the links to all that. You can see your social media on the lower third graphic if you're watching on the video. Elizabeth Grace Matthews, thank you so much for the time, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, ma'am. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Main. Church and Main is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church and Main podcasts at the website churchandmain.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Hurt Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics 
from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutans. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find the Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thesweatypenguin.com.